Many years ago, I was notified of a house fire. As I came on the scene to provide assistance in whatever way I could as a local minister, a house was engulfed in flames, and I saw the mother of this family in the street waiting to find out uh, what had happened with her children. In, as I came on the scene and came to the mother, she was notified by an emergency personnel that her baby had passed away in the flames. Immediately, she hit the ground, wailing, sobbing in tears. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in such a position, the terrible pain of her suffering that she was going through at that moment. Another time, my wife and I were able to, to give some time to be able to go down to the Gulf of Mexico and to help uh, with some relief following the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, one of the most powerful, devastating hurricanes ever to hit the shores of the United States. And we were doing some work in Biloxi, Mississippi, and we saw houses that had just been taken away and there was just nothing left but the slab of cement. Churches, nothing there but just the metal frames that they were built on, businesses gone. I can't imagine what it is like to go and after a hurricane to see everything you've worked for gone, having to start all over again. The suffering, the terrible suffering that the survivors of these tragedies went through. Jesus once said this, in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What I want to talk about is how to have victory in the face of suffering and how to overcome. All of us have gone through some level of suffering, so we can identify with that, and I want to help us to walk through it with that spirit of victory. And how can we do that? Through the person of Jesus Christ. He has the answers where we are lacking. I want to do that in two ways. One, by giving an understanding of exactly what suffering is. And then the second part, practically, how to walk through it with victory by overcoming various obstacles that come with it. So let's dive in and start with understanding. And with understanding, we get into it by realizing there are various kinds of suffering. When we talk about suffering, somebody might say, well, I've never lost a baby in a house fire, so I haven't really suffered. Or somebody might say, you know, I've never had my home taken away in a hurricane. I don't understand what it's, what it's like to suffer. I think we all can understand what it's like to suffer when we understand what it is. I haven't done a comprehensive list, just a few things that came to mind I jotted down and, and wrote this down. First, there's physical suffering dealing with health issues such as death, dying, sickness, chronic pain, people dealing with lifelong or seasonal disabilities. Physical sufferings regarding things, you know, like disasters we've talked about, house fire, hurricane, I live in the Midwest, the Great Plains, tornadoes. Other things like a job loss, getting the pink slip, get laid off, can't find a job, working hard. People also might suffer at the hands of physical, uh, physically in terms of bankruptcy, losing everything they've worked for financially. Also dealing with mental suffering, such as mental illnesses, disorders like PTSD, bipolar, depression, and various forms of addictions. Also relational suffering, people having walked through the tragic experience of divorce. Um, people who walk through continual, it seems like, conflicts within their family. Uh, people going after each other or even friends. And also boyfriends and girlfriends, breakups and clashes. Difficult, difficult times. And then also dealing with spiritual suffering, such as Christian persecution, spiritual warfare, and then also spiritual discipline, where God is disciplining us for a season. I, I think this list probably has about covered everybody on the planet Earth in some way, shape, or form. And no doubt, it's covered me and, and probably just all of us. It is a true statement to say this, is that we live in a world full of hurting people. Sometimes that can be thrown out there as a blanket statement that ends up kind of meaningless. But, you know, after you think of uh, really what suffering is, we really do live in a world filled with hurting people. Let me ask this 
next question is, which is this, why do we have suffering? I mean, wouldn't it be nice to live in a world without suffering? And, and was there ever a time where the world didn't have it? Well, to understand the origin of suffering, we have to roll back the tape on human history way, way far back. We have to go back to our first ancestors, which is way before the primate Lucy and way before tadpoles and big bangs and all these other things. We have to go back to Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve, the first humans to ever be created and walk the planet Earth. And one day, at one point, God and Adam and Eve lived in great fellowship together. They knew each other by name, face to face. They walked together. They were together constantly. And when God set them in the most beautiful place on the planet Earth called the Garden of Eden, he gave them just one directive. Don't eat of this tree or its fruit that it bears. Everything else except for here. Well, you know what they did, just like our kids do. <laughs> you give them one thing they're not supposed to do, and what do they do? That one thing. And so that's what Adam and Eve did. They went to that one tree and took of its fruit and ate, and that one act changed everything. One day God came into the garden, and usually Adam and Eve came to him, and they fellowshiped together. But for the first time God came in the garden, they ran away from him. They took off, and they hid themselves. God instantly knew something was wrong. This hadn't happened before. And that's when the first act of suffering came into the world, relational suffering. It was as if that one moment of what the Bible calls sin when they disobeyed God opened up the portals of hell, a wormhole, to use a sci-fi a sci-fi word, like a wormhole of hell opened up and and just all the evil, the wickedness, the darkness of hell came, uh, came out of it and spread across the earth, bringing all kinds of suffering everywhere, including right there in that garden. And in that moment of that garden, the relationship between God and mankind shattered, divided right there. And God knew he had to remove Adam and Eve from his presence. You know what? And that is the first of just many relationships in the course of human history that have just been shattered at the hands of sin that have caused tremendous suffering in homes and families and marriages throughout the world for centuries, millennia of human history. So that's where suffering came from and why we have it. Next, I want to get into an understanding of what suffering is in terms of the words. And I love understanding words, their definitions, what they mean. And I love the Bible because it's filled with rich words that have so much meaning. And so I've tried to create a list. Again, it's not exhaustive, but just a short list of what suffering means according to a few different words. And so let's start with the word suffering itself and then some associated words. The word suffering is to experience or be afflicted with painful hardships or troubles that seem to be a setback, but really aren't. It is interesting, when we go through a terrible time of a hardship, we instantly, on the spot, view it as negative, painful, hurtful, bad, nothing good about it. But then over time, over time, we're able to see it in a different light and realize that maybe something positive, something good could come out of this in some way. That's the word suffering. And then some related words, the word tribulation. The word tribulation is to experience great internal pressure, a terrible squeezing, like somebody who's claustrophobic, you know, trying to get into a small space. They feel a pressure inside, a squeezing. And it comes with sometimes where we feel like we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. We got more questions than answers. Have you ever experienced the kind of suffering that is a tribulation where you just don't know where to go or what to do with the situation that you're facing? Another word related to suffering is trial. The word trial, you can come at it from two different ways. One 
is a testing, a season of testing, where God is testing us in order to grow us in our understanding and knowing Him and fellowship with Him. And then the other word is temptation, where the devil himself is tempting us in areas of weakness that we might sin against ourselves, against our loved ones, against God. Have you ever been tempted by the devil? I think I know the answer, or all of us probably have. Then the next and the final word regarding suffering is the word sorrow. And sorrow, grief, grief, sorrow can be used interchangeably. And what this word means is to have sorrow or grief is to experience such a heavy-hearted distress that it weighs a person down, so much so that it shows signs physically. Have you ever been around somebody who you are aware of that has gone through some type of terrible suffering and you can see it wearing on them physically? Their eyes may look, their face may look gaunt. They may have lost weight. They're not sleeping well. They're not eating well. And it's taking a physical toll on them. Enough so where you say, are you doing okay? You look like you're going through a really rough time. How are you doing? So again, probably with these words here, I've covered about everybody in terms of getting a better understanding of what suffering is and realizing that we have all walked through suffering. We all have. And you know, as we walk through the different kinds and we walk through understanding the words, there's an element to it that we're going to talk about next that they all have in common. All this thing about suffering has in common one aspect, a mystery element to it. We can read the books and go to the seminars and listen to talking heads like me, get all the information that we're trying. And in the end, in the end, we may be able to have an intelligent conversation about what we went through, but the answers don't seem to satisfy. The information that we've gained doesn't seem to satisfy. So I want to share briefly about the mystery of suffering. This has been going on a long time. Even Jesus' own disciples that followed him around for three years. There's a story that I think we can identify with. One day, Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and the disciples came across a fellow that they obviously knew. He was doing some begging, and he was on the side of this road. He was blind. He had a disability since birth. His disciples knew it, were making some assumptions, turned to Jesus and said, hey, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, unfortunately, they were making some not very wise assumptions about why this suffering took place. You ever been there before where somebody says, hey, I know why you're suffering. It's because this happened to you and that happened to you and this happened to you. That's why you're going through what you're going through. Sometimes people say the wrong things at the wrong time. But what this reveals, the deeper thing about the disciples, is something that we have in common. We all want to know why. Why, Lord? Why did this happen? What have I done? What has my family done? What has gone on in my life that, that this has happened? I don't deserve this. So there's an element of mystery. They, the, in the book of Ruth, in the Old Testament of the Bible, there's a story that goes like this. The husband of Naomi died. She was left with her two sons. These took wives. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. In a period of about 10 years, Naomi lost her husband and became a widow, probably at a very young age. Then her two adult children eventually married, had a good married life for about 10 years, each of them, but then her two young sons, that doesn't explain why they died, but they died tragically, and they left their two young wives without husbands. They also were widows. So a terrible situation where a wife and a mother has lost her husband and her two sons in a short period of time at a young age. And as I look at this in the Bible, God is not mentioned. No answer is given as to why this happened. You know what we do in a case like this where there are no answers? We sometimes throw out the bumper sticker phrase that is, well, God allowed it. You know, we may say that, we may even agree with it, but you know what? There's still an element of mystery to that. 
It doesn't satisfy, does it? There's a Bible verse that says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, speaking of God, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I think this is a Bible verse that is really good in terms of providing an answer for suffering. And the answer is this, is that there are some things we just can't understand. Even if we try to, even if we were given the answer for why, the answer still wouldn't satisfy because there's an element of suffering that is really beyond our understanding. But you know who does understand? God, even though we may not. Now, I want to move next, after we have looked at the understanding of what suffering is, to dealing with God. Sometimes we may wonder whether an atheist or whether we are a faithful follower of God, we both might ask the same question. Where are you, God, in this? God, why did you allow this to happen? As a matter of fact, some people who've gone through suffering, who had some element of faith, may as a result of this turn their back on God and said, God, because this happened, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Well, let's understand about where God is in the midst of suffering. First off, God the Father and God the Son can identify and have compassion for us because of their own suffering. God suffered when from heaven he looked down upon the earth and he saw his own son suffering at the hands of evil, wicked, vile, selfish, and mean men who beat him and bruised him and then ultimately crucified and killed him on a terrible, terrible cross long ago. God suffered as, as he watched his son suffer. And then Jesus himself, God's son, suffered because he himself was the personal victim of the beatings, of being spit upon, of being abandoned by his friends, of having the nails in his hands and in his feet and the crown of thorns on his head and being whipped in his back and ultimately crucified, terrible state execution upon that cross. The prophet Isaiah says of Jesus to help us understand how he understands he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one with whom men hid their faces he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities he was oppressed he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter you see Jesus understands God understands our suffering because God has suffered and his son has suffered as we can see. And as a result of this suffering, the scripture says about Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And then listen to this part. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We are able to conquer the sting the terrible sting of suffering because two things. One, there is a God and his son, Jesus Christ, who can identify because they have suffered too. They know what we're going through because they have experienced the sting too. And then secondly, is that we can go through suffering with a sense of victory because God himself and his son, Jesus Christ say, come unto me in your time of suffering. Come unto me and I will dispense to you an immeasurable amount of grace, mercy, kindness, and compassion if we will come unto him. See, God isn't far off some way in our time of suffering, far off, distant, some mythical spirit being out there where we're left to fend for ourselves and truly the heavens are as brass. No, God is near if we will call upon him in faith. His grace and his mercy is for us. Now, our Savior and our God was victorious the moment he took up the cross and began the slow walk towards his death. The scripture says about Jesus this, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the throne of God. Now, let's look a little bit at this victorious example that Jesus has given as we face our suffering. First off, only convicted criminals were put to death on this cross, yet 
Ironically, Jesus was the perfect son of God who never sinned. Now, Jesus despises public shame. There was a sense of shame that came with this cross because it was something that was meant for criminals. Well, here is Jesus, the perfect son of God, dying a criminal's death. And it was uh, looked, perceived on publicly as something shameful to die on a cross. But yet Jesus took that shame and turned it around. He took what was despised by the public and turned it into something beautiful. No matter what type of suffering you're dealing with, maybe there's a sense of shame that comes with what you're going through. Definitely a sense of sorrow and grief. Well, that which you despise, through Christ, you can have the power to turn that which you despise into something beautiful. The cross is an example of that. Once it was despised and ugly, now we turn it into gold and silver, beautiful pieces of wood and wear it, wear it around our necks on our shirts, put it, you know, on our churches because it's something beautiful. Well, God, through the power of Christ, can turn your tragedy in his time and his wisdom into something beautiful. And secondly, Jesus endured the cross. Yes, he asked his father if this cup of suffering, of pain could pass. Yes, he cried out and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Revealing the, the pain and the sorrow and the grief that he was bearing. Yes, he did. However, he never ran from it. He never looked for a way of escape, but he remained faithful to his father all to the way to the end to where he could honestly say with a clear conscience, it is finished. Like Jesus we may cry out in our humanness and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we may curse God. We may hold up our fist in God's face in our humanness. But God does not call us to stay there, to camp out there for weeks, for months, for years, for decades on end. Through the power of Jesus Christ, he can give us the ability to endure to endure and to make it. Sometimes what we're going through, we're saying, I don't know how I can make it. I don't know. Through the power of Jesus Christ, we can. And that leads us next to the understanding that we're not alone in our time of suffering if we know Christ as Lord and Savior. As Jesus faced his journey to the cross, he appeared to be alone. All of his disciples turned tail and left him. He had one of his disciples that actually turned him into the authorities. It looked like he was alone. But the truth is, the spirit of his father was always there with him. In your time of suffering, it may feel like you're alone, like nobody understands. Or at night, especially in the morning or on the holidays, it feels like you're all alone. Well, you're not. Jesus... God, whom you can't see with your eyes, is there. And they are waiting for you to call out to them to receive the victory that is available to you. There's a poem I want to share that over the years I've seen in various churches and, and, uh, and in homes. It's called Footprints in the Sand by Mary Stevenson. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord across the dark, Sky flash scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back on the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then I carried you. For Jesus himself said this, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, one point of clarification about this poem. 
when it feels like there's one set of footprints during a time of suffering, it could be because there really is only one set of footprints. Let's camp on that for just a moment. I heard a, a well-known radio talk radio host once say, we're all God's children. Have you ever heard that before? That's not true. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. And in order to experience that one set of footprints moment in your time of suffering, you got to move from being God's creation to being God's child. And how do you do that? You become what the Bible calls born again. To be born again means to believe. To believe in Jesus with all of your heart. To entrust yourself fully and wholly to him. And secondly, it means to repent. It means to turn from those areas of sin that you know you ought not do. But you call upon him in faith and you say, God, I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Help me to turn from these areas of sin and to walk away from them. Thirdly, it means to call upon God in faith, to call upon him with all of your heart. There is a, a song that is called Come As You Are. The musical artist David Crowder has recorded it. Let me share these lyrics with you. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart. Come as you are. The scripture says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This moment, right now, is your moment to come as you are to Christ. So in your time of suffering, there really is only one set of footprints, not because you're doing life on your own, but because Christ is before you, behind you, beside you, within you, carrying you. Call upon him. Call upon him in faith, in your own words, in your own way, with a spirit of belief, in a spirit of repentance, in a spirit of desperation, call upon him and you'll be born again. Thanks for watching and stay with us because in just a moment, we're going to share with you how you can contact us for a free Bible and Bible study. We want to do everything we can to help you in your journey to know and to follow Christ. May Jesus be your hope for today. Thanks for tuning into the broadcast today. Clint wants to help you in your spiritual journey, so he's offering you a gift. If you contact him today, he'll send you a Bible and Bible study at no cost. You can reach Clint through our website, toll-free number, or by writing him. We look forward to hearing from you. This has been a production of the Ministry of Great Awakenings. On behalf of our team and the supporters who make this program possible, I'm Rod Keen. Now may God richly bless you, and please tune in again next time for another episode of Hope for Today with Clint Decker.